Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. Well, I got my migraine most of the way gone. Um, still hanging on there a little bit. I just last couple of days have been pretty rough. Just really tired. Last couple of weeks, but last couple of days especially. But I got a little bit of a reprieve. Got to. Uh, I got a couple of weeks before having my next appointment. So, and that one's in San Antonio, which is the place I hate to go to the most. But we will endeavor to persevere. So uh, today we are going to be, or tonight I should say, we're going to be reading out of Ezekiel 16.6, which we're in the book of Ezekiel. And if you, got, you guys should remember this part. When I passed by thee, I said unto thee, live. The whole verse says, and when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to, I said to you, in your blood, live. Now this was the section in Ezekiel 16 where he was talking about Israel. Very interesting description here about how he brought this nation up. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, oh, right at the beginning. The Lord's faithless bride. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. That's where Abraham was from. See, they really had a hatred for the Canaanites, not realizing that's where they came from. <laughs> See, a lot of people don't understand this because a lot of preachers don't preach this. Abraham was a Gentile before God brought the nation of Israel out of him and set them apart. The whole world was Gentile. This was so interesting about the perfect work that he's doing about salvation. Gentiles are not excluded from salvation. In fact, salvation came through Abraham, who was a Gentile, and changed and become something new from them. Pretty amazing. It all connects. Um, your father was an Amorite, which was, which was uh, uh, Abraham, and your mother a Hittite, which is his wife. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown out into the open field, when you yourself were loathed on the day you were born. And when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood live. I made you thrive like a plant in the field, and you grew, matured, and became very beautiful. Your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Now, a lot of people, when they read these scriptures like this, they read them in the wrong way. They read them from a carnal, very carnal state of mind. Uh, the Song of Solomon is the same thing. A lot of people read it from a carnal state of mind. Look at it from a spiritual standpoint, and you realize he's not referring to physical things. He's using physical descriptions to refer to spiritual things. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood, and I anointed you with oil. Washed you with water, baptism. It's a spiritual, there's a spiritual baptism there. Anointed you with oil, Holy Spirit. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. Fine linen is the select clothing only for specific people. If you read in the book of Revelation, people have, some people have white robes, but not everybody has fine linen. As a matter of fact, if you look at it, Anywhere you only see where Jesus, because Jesus is mentioned in the Old Testament, every time you see, I saw the angel of the Lord dressed in fine linen or dressed in linen, that's Jesus. Jesus and the bride are the only ones that get fine linen. Fine linen is very specific for specific individuals. It's very select. Everybody else gets white robes. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrists, and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus, you were adorned with gold and silver. And your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. They were brought into royalty. Now, if you remember this chapter, it kind of ends bad because he gave them everything. 
and they didn't accept it. And it's pretty bad. But he's going to save them no matter what. Much the same way he looks at us before we're saved, we're there, cast out, cord still attached, struggling in our own blood. And he comes and says, I have salvation for you. Live. And we live. Saved one. Consider gratefully. He's addressing us. Saved one. Consider gratefully this mandate of mercy. Note that this fiat of God is majestic. In our text, we perceive a sinner with nothing in him but sin, expecting nothing but wrath. But the eternal Lord passes by in his glory. He looks. He pauses. And he pronounces the solitary but royal word, live. There speaks a God who put, or sorry, who but he could venture thus to deal with life and dispense it with a single syllable. He spoke all of creation into existence, sure. Again, this fiat is manifold. When he saith live, it includes many things. Here is judicial life. The sinner is ready to be condemned, but the mighty one saith live, and he rises pardoned and absolved. It is spiritual life. We knew not Jesus. Our eyes could not see Christ. Our ears could not hear his voice. Jehovah said, live. And we were quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Moreover, it includes glory, life, which is the perfection of spiritual life. I said unto thee, live. And that word rolls on through all the years of time till death comes. And in the midst of the shadows of death, the Lord's voice is still heard, live. In the morning of the resurrection, it is that self-same voice which is echoed by the archangel live and as holy spirits rise to heaven to be blessed forever in the glory of their God. It is in the power of this same word, live. That's us. It's all of us who are saved. Note again that it is an irresistible mandate. Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus to arrest the saints of the living God. A voice is heard from heaven, and a light is seen above the brightness of the sun. And Saul is crying out, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This mandate is a mandate of free grace. When sinners are saved, it is only and solely because God will do it to magnify his free, unpurposed, pur purchased, unsought grace. Christians, see your position debtors to grace. Show your gratitude by earnest Christ-like lives, and as God has bidden you live, see to it that you live in earnest. Beautiful. In the hustle and bustle of life, we forget what we have been given. And when we take our eyes off of that, it causes us to get into fear, self-condemnation, guilt, worry, becoming troubled by the things we see. And what we need is we need a reminder. You are a chosen one of God. You are a child of God. You have been given something that no other creature will ever be able to attain. Angels in heaven don't get to have what we have. Oh, they're angels. Oh, they're great. They're very powerful. They don't get to have what we have. What we are given is very special, very unique. To the point that we are being made a new creation that has never existed before. See, there was a spiritual being and then there was physical beings. In Christ, we become something different. We become spiritual and physical together. A joining of the two, which was thought impossible. But, in fact, through his sacrifice on the cross, has become incredible. You can have a physical body and a spiritual one at the same exact time. You can exist in heaven and here on earth at the exact same time. You can be in both forms at once. You can be in multiple places at once. There are all kinds of crazy things that we're going to be able to address and, and do and learn and be in that new form. That gift is only given to God's elect, to God's chosen, to God's children. What a special gift. What an amazing gift that we, who are so far down on the pole, in Christ will be elevated up above with him. 
the Bible records that even the angels want to know more about this. This is incredible to them. This is astounding to them. What an amazing, amazing thing God is doing. And we forget that, that if we have salvation, this world has holds nothing for us. That's why we live the way Christ lived, not physically, spiritually. You don't put a robe on, get a staff and sandals, and go run around. I'm asking my wife where her monitor is so I can hook up this other computer because she had a, a monitor somewhere around here. I can't find it. Um, in this life, we, we start to we start to realize because we realize our sin, we, realize, we go back to the thing. People try to make us feel guilty about it. People try to rake us over the coals. You know, when you or you finally get to the point where you realize none of this has any effect on me. And when they come to you and they start laying this guilt trip on you, mm, nope. What do you mean, no? I'm not going to let you make me feel guilty about something that's good. I'm not going to let you make me feel guilty about what I believe in. I'm not going to let you make me feel guilty because I accepted a free gift that was given to me by God and you didn't. Instead of you making me feel guilty, why don't you go ask him for it? Why don't you go receive it too? You want to make me feel bad about myself because I'm going to be saved and I'm going to go and live with the Lord and be with him forever. Well, if you're walking in darkness, that's your problem. Fix it. There's light standing right next to you. Reach out and grab a hold of it. But see, that's what they do, is they'll get mad at us because we have hope. That's why people fight and argue against the pre trial rapture. It holds all the hope. There's no hope in any other version of it. That's why people fight against all kinds of true doctrine that are in the Bible. There's hope in the true doctrine. There's no hope in any other doctrine. But when they get into that doctrine, they get so blinded that they get mad at the people with hope. Who are you to think that there's going to be a, a rapture and, and, and the, the Christians are going to be taken off this earth? How arrogant. How, it's not arrogant. It's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that. How dare you think you're going to get to leave where everybody else is suffering? Mm, because that's what the Lord said. There's a reason why those people are going to be suffering. And I play no part in that because I have already received that free gift that he has offered me. I have already walked and stepped into the sheepfold. There's, that's, that serves no purpose for me. Oh, we have to be tested. We have to be I'm tested every single day. I don't know about you. Your life must be fantastic. I'm tested every day. Every minute of every day. Long into the night. When everyone else is asleep. I'm still awake. Tormented. Tormented by thoughts and memories. Tribulation would be a welcome respite because my chances are higher of finally passing on to the next realm and getting away from all this pain. See, they don't understand because they haven't experienced it. The Christian, though, though we live and though we seek to go be with the Lord. So Paul talks about this quite extensively. I'd rather die and go be with the Lord than be here. But right now, it's more important that I'm here because of you guys and the glory of God. That's that's like that for all of us. So they don't understand. We have something so unique and so special. We have something so personal and intimate. As children of God, chosen by Him from the beginning of all things, and it's not arrogant to say that you have that. It's not arrogant to believe that you have that. Now, if you lord that over somebody, that's a little bit different. If you use it for to take advantage of other people, that's quite a bit different. There's a lot of people that do that. Know who you are in Christ. This takes almost all of the ammunition away from the enemy to accuse you and inflict pain and suffering on you. This takes everybody's ability to chastise you and make you feel guilty about what you have away from them. 
so that they cannot do that. Oh, they can speak. It's irrelevant. And when they talk, you shouldn't really be talking about something you don't know enough about. You should actually probably read the scriptures and see what this is all about first before you come and have a discussion about it. I hold no guilt for having what I have because the Lord gave it and I, I accepted this free gift not to make anybody else feel bad but because it's the only place where I can find hope it's the only thing to look forward to in this life the first sentence says it all saved one consider gratefully this mandate of mercy and we should consider what we have in him and just how important it is. And you know, whenever you come to that realization, when you get that thought clear in your head and you, you do this the right way, not using it for advantage, not trying to you know, make yourself out to be something you're not, but operate from a place of humility like the Lord has said, like he did. He was, he was the son of the father of heaven. And he held himself in no higher regard than anybody else. That's our example. The things of this life cease to become a problem. Not all the time, it's not perfect, but they cease to become a problem. And you see a greater, and this is, I'm actually getting conviction on a particular issue that I'm dealing with right now because of this, as I'm speaking. You, it ceases to become an issue. It ceases to become something that, that is a detriment. You work through this life, you do what you have to do, and you move on. Anywhere you are in the world, anywhere you live, any capacity that you have, you can serve the Lord. And as his children, that's what we're called to do. To a greater or lesser degree is irrelevant. Someone's able to do greater because of what they have uh, at their disposal? Great. Somebody who's only able to offer prayer? It's equal. They're equal in the, in the eyes of God. They're equal in Christ. What does it say? What does the Bible say? There's no richer Jew or Greek. There's no rich or poor. There's no free or slave. There's no male or female. All are one in Christ Jesus. I like that. I like that. Let us consider what has been done for us. Let us consider what he has done and remind ourselves of the literal moving, moving of heaven and earth to create a way for us to be able to enter heaven. And let us regard that with much higher degree. It's a saving grace. It's a wonderful mercy. It's a show of the greatest level of love to take a lost soul and convert them to be a citizen of heaven. And that's what we have. And you guys have no idea what we're about to witness and what we're about to see. When we get over there, your mind is going to be completely blown away at just what the Lord... The Bible says this quite clearly. No mind has ever imagined what the Lord has laid up for them in heaven. It says, pleasures forevermore at the right hand of the Father. We can't even imagine what he has in store for us. What he has set up for us. What's going, what's going to happen up there. I'm, I'm anxious to see it. Let us remind each other and remind ourselves the wonderful, wonderful gift we have. And let us use the knowledge of that to change our walk in this life, to make us walk more circumspect with the will of God, more circumspect with his truth, and more like Christ. Let us live, just like he said in the devotion, let us live for Christ in this life and show our appreciation to the Father. He calls for action. It's a verb. He calls us to do something doer of the word. Let us do that. Let us be that. There's nothing but good that can come out of it. Oh, sure, there's people that are going to go out there and they're going to start laying guilt trip on you. Oh, you're, you're back-loading and front-loading words. You're side-loading words. You're top and bottom-loading words. Your opinion is irrelevant because I can read the scriptures and understand them quite clearly. And he says, do this, do that, and that's, that's what I'm going to do, because he's the authority, no one else. So they can rage. They can sling accusations. Who cares? Who cares what they think? Who cares what they say? We know the truth because we're reading into the scripture. That's what we go by. 
because that's what the authority is, because that's the truth of God. You are a saved sinner, a Christian who's been born again. You were lost and now you're found. You were blind, but now you see, quoting Amazing Grace. And it is by that mercy, that love, that amazing grace that he has shown us that we have these things. By the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, shedding his blood to pay that debt we owed for sin, we have access to heaven. Let us revel in how wonderful that is. And let us show our appreciation to our God of heaven, the great king of the universe. The gratitude we have for what he's done for us by living the life he has told us to live. By living the life and living the way he has given us the examples of in the scripture. Let us use discernment. Let us use right judgment. Let us exercise and exhibit the love of God that is in our hearts to the world around us. To the best of our ability. And wait on our Lord and watch for him. He's coming. We're in the season. This is it. It's just a matter of time, guys. It's just a matter of time. Share the truth with any and everyone you can. If they won't receive it, they won't receive it. It's no skin off your nose. Share with anyone you can. Let them see you live for God. Because it just may be, if they don't get saved now, they will when the tribulation starts. And they will be a part of that great multitude that no man can number that John saw standing in heaven. Serving and ministering to God day and night. See, we have something very unique and very special above all others. We're the bride of Jesus Christ. Only a select group of people get that Wonderful, wonderful privilege. And it's because of that that so much more grace and mercy is shed out to others before and after. See, with man it's impossible to comprehend these things and to make these things happen, but with God everything is possible. And he will make a way. Like he told Moses, I will show mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will not have mercy on whom I will not have mercy. But his desire is to have mercy on all. Let us honor that. And that great love with which he loved us, let us honor that. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I will see you in the next video.